Well, hello everyone. I'm very, very pleased to see all of you joining us here for the sort of the debut of the Breakthrough Lab 2021 uh, cohort ventures. And my name is Jason Harry. I'm the director of the Breakthrough Lab. I also teach in the School of Engineering here at Brown University. And Breakthrough Lab is uh, one of the one of the big uh, premier programs of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship here at Brown. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues in the Nelson Center. Uh, da uh, Danny Warshe is here. He's the executive director of the Nelson Center. Jonas Clark is the associate director. Hi. Uh, and Liz Malone is the assistant director for programs. All of us work really, really hard on B-Lab uh, throughout the year, especially in the summer. Uh, but I really thank those, uh, those folks and others uh, on the team to, that make this all possible. Well, we're running this program in virtual mode again this year, and that's got its upsides and its downsides. One of the upsides is, is that we can welcome students into our program from all over the United States. We have students right now in, in uh, Minnesota, in, in uh, Georgia, California, uh, Washington State, and even from West Africa, the country of Gambia. And it also allows all of you to join from wherever you are in the world. And we were really excited to see uh, registrants from Europe, from Switzerland and Germany, from Turkey, from China, India, Pakistan, and even, I'm not sure I'll get Tuvalu, which a little Google search will tell you is a South Pacific Island. So uh, I'm not sure our guest from Tuvalu is there, but we at least had uh, that as a, as a registrant. And, you know, I, I actually think that global scope really uh, is an indication of how compelling student entrepreneurship is. It really gives us an opportunity to glimpse a little piece of the future, at least as we uh, as we watch our students present today. So I really appreciate each of you making time to join us this afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Let me tell you very briefly what we're gonna do. This is a pretty fast moving uh, uh, event. Uh, the main event is about an hour. Uh, we'll spend a, a few minutes here with an introductions. Then we're going to dive into a really interesting conversation with David Roenick, a serial entrepreneur and Brown University graduate. Uh, and uh, then we will hear from the ventures in rapid uh, succession. And then uh, at the top of the hour, we will have uh, breakout rooms, one for each venture, and you'll have an opportunity to uh, pop back and forth in a very casual interaction with the students and learn more about the ventures and so forth. So that's our plan, about an hour of the formal program and then a half an hour of uh, casual interaction with the students. And we welcome you to do that. I wanted to say just a couple of words about the Breakthrough Lab. You know, it's, it's basically a venture accelerator. It's for student ventures. All of these ventures that you're going to hear about today come from the minds and the passions of students. And that's really a key uh, aspect of the program. They spend about eight weeks here in the summer. They work full time on their ventures and they draw from expertise uh, both inside the university and outside the university. Uh, certainly, I work a lot with the ventures, but we also have uh, in-house uh, entrepreneurs and residents. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Jonas Clark is serving in that role. We also have Shannon Shalcross. Shannon, I'm not sure if you're on screen, but thank you for your uh, participation. And also Hamza Ansari is one of our summer uh, B-Lab entrepreneurs and residents. So thanks uh, very much for that. But we also rely heavily on uh, experts, mentors, uh, friends, business people, entrepreneurs from outside the university. I wanted to just take a moment. Literally dozens of people have helped B-Lab over the years. If you have ever worked with a B-Lab venture as a mentor, give us some kind of an emoji or wave crazily uh, or flash your video on and off. Uh, and, and I'll just let you let everyone sort of um, uh, page back and forth and just see uh, some of the, the B-Lab venture mentors that have been part of our past. So, well, wonderful. And that really, we could not do it without the help of, of all of, of you guys. Well, uh, I think it's fair to characterize our B-Lab ventures as early stage. 
And uh, this, this is an, our first opportunity for the ventures to really meet you, the public. And it's partly to give them practice as students to talk about their ventures, but it's also meant to give you an opportunity to interact with them. And so let's just take a moment for our current B-Lab participants to uh, emoji and wave just so that you can start to put a, a, a face and a video uh, with the, with the uh, present B-Lab. Thanks, you guys. I'm really proud of, of all the students in the program this year. Um, and so those are our current B-Lab participants. And what's been really fun, we reached out to the B-Lab alum community. And if you are a B-Lab alum, take a moment to just emoji and wave at us crazily. Uh, we have uh, well over a hundred students who are B-Lab alums, and many of them have made time to join us today. So to cheer, to cheer the new crop on. Uh, finally, I wanted to just uh, acknowledge uh, a greater community of entrepreneurship around Brown and in the Providence area. Uh, we have, uh, there's some really, really cool activities that happen in the community. Uh, I want to acknowledge Annette Tanti, who is the director of RI Hub, which is sort of the a Rhode Island and Southeast New England uh, entrepreneurship hub. I also wanted to mention um, Hope Hopkins, who is the director of Mass Challenge, which is really a, a, a national, international um, uh, entrepreneurship organization. Uh, and Hope has, uh, Hope uh, is, and, and Mass Challenge is actually one of the landing pads for our B-Lab ventures. After they've done B-Lab, uh, many of them end up in, in uh, Mass Challenge, which is a, really a, a wonderful uh, uh, program that uh, takes them to the next level. Uh, also acknowledging Kevin Jankowski, our partner. Hi, Kevin, I do see you from RISD. Uh, this is a joint program with, RIS with RISD and we, we um, invite and really appreciate having RISD participants in the program. And then finally, not seeing uh, Barrett Hazeltine on video at the moment, but Barrett is obviously the sort of the, the grandfather, if you will, or the, the originator of entrepreneurship at Brown University. Most of the entrepreneurial DNA uh, at this university can somehow tie back to Barrett. Uh, and maybe uh, David, you may even, David's nodding. He may actually want to uh, acknowledge uh, the impact that Barrett has had on him. All right. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is just uh, encourage as we as we move forward, whether it's with David or with the ventures, uh, really have a, an interactive experience. I want to encourage you to put stuff in the chat, uh, to use emojis and whatever. Uh, I do want to say that we are recording this event. If that has any impact on uh, the kinds of things you say and do, uh, but uh, but that's that's uh, that's what we're up to. All right. Well, I want to transition from opening remarks to uh, an opportunity to have a, a really uh, nice chat with David Ronick, who is um, uh, a Brown graduate um, and serial entrepreneur. And, you know, I've gotten to know David a little bit as we've gotten prepared for this event. And I've been impressed with his introspection and his thoughtfulness. And so part of my uh, job today is to bring that out in him. Uh, David, great to see you. Thanks for making time uh, to chat with us and share some of your experiences as an entrepreneur. And, you know, uh, as I've gotten to know a little bit about your background, except for maybe selling jeans for Tommy Hilfiger and Polo for a few years, I think Correct me if I'm wrong, literally everything you've done professionally has been in a startup mode. Is that fair to say? Pretty much. I tried on a real job uh, right out of Brown, but uh, it didn't take. It didn't take. Well, I was curious, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, given your long run as an entrepreneur, was there something in the water? And get this, everyone, the English department at Brown, <laughs> was there, what, what was going on in the English department in the late 80s uh, that got you teed up for entrepreneurship? It's just crazy. Well, I think you you know you, you mentioned uh, Barrett Hazeltine, who was who was then Dean Hazeltine, and yes, uh, I, you know I'm so impressed. First of all, that that what you're all up to and that this exists, I'm I'm a little jealous. I wish it had existed <laughs> when right. I was when I was an undergrad, uh, but it's amazing what you're doing. Um, so congrats. Um, and uh, you know, I guess for me it was I I went and tried working at some big companies. My father had worked for a big company for for his whole career, and I uh -huh. saw the 
bureaucracy. And, wow. and I had some experience um, in internships and first jobs um, uh, seeing entrepreneurs. So seeing someone like Tommy Hilfiger and just watching them uh, build something out of sheer kind of charisma and willing it to happen. Uh, despite a lot of setbacks and Tommy never went to college and oh, interesting. Uh, he, he had this big, bold kind of vision and, uh, and, and it just, it was exciting. Uh, I think also the speed at which you could see uh, impact at some of these companies where you see them start and grow super, super quickly or fail. But, uh, but I've, I've always been more of a builder than a, an optimizer, I think. Oh, interesting. You know, I, the reason I was sort of joking about what was in the water in the English department is, is partly to acknowledge that, you know, entrepreneurs can come from all kinds of training. And uh, I, think, I think students often feel like uh, that there's a, a particular golden pathway through their education that somehow is going to prepare them specially for business or entrepreneurship. Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't kind of your, your pathway in the early going. No, I think a lot of times that's kind of a uh, revisionist history, right? We kind of look oh, back and I can, I can, I can explain if I need to, that why this all makes sense, but uh, it, it didn't at the time. <laughs> it didn't at the time. Well, so <laughs> if, if it's okay, let's, let's talk about the sort of recent past for a few minutes. Uh, I know that you were the founder and CEO of Stash, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, Take us to the early days of Stash. Were you were you working on that as a as a, a solo founder, or had you gotten around the kitchen table with some colleagues to to come up with it? Just take us back to the the really early days of that idea. Sure. So it was twenty early twenty fifteen, I think, uh, and I had just come out of an accelerator, the Tech Stars. Uh, oh, interesting. So similar to to B Lab in a way, and uh, and I was. Uh, I was renting a desk at Techstars New York and okay. thinking of ideas and meeting with people. And uh, there was a there were there were, there was a guy that I met with that we I met socially um, named Brandon, and he had he worked at Macquarie Bank, at a, 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 an Australian investment bank, and he had okay. a bunch of colleagues, and they were bored. They had made a lot of money in banking, but just weren't fulfilled. And after the market closed one day, they came in and said, hey, can we run an idea by you? And I took them through a kind of a, a lean, uh, you know, lean startup uh, exercise and pretty much oh, okay. I, I found a couple of big, big holes in their, in their idea. And uh, well, we use a lean canvas. I don't know if you use that, but, uh, but, right. but so, and, 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 and so while that original idea didn't fly and the group of people kind of wasn't, didn't end up uh, panning out, it started our conversations and they just started coming back every day after the market closed. Uh, and we were just kicking ideas around. Um, and one of the ideas was that uh, we, the, the, the three, it turned out the three of us ended up staying with gotcha. it, um, Brandon, me and Ed, and the three of us had always invested with our, usually with our, our, our dads had taught us to invest and it's something that we did with them uh -huh. our whole lives. And, uh, and these guys were investing professionals and nobody right. that worked for them invested at all. And, That's interesting. and it struck me that a lot of the people that I rubbed elbows with at tech stars who are a lot younger than I am, they didn't invest either. And we started thinking, it's kind of interesting. Why is that? Is this, is, is this a, a, tr a real trend or is this gotcha. just us? And uh -huh. um, what's, what's going on in the market? And, and um, you know, you would ask me when we were kind of, preparing this, like, how do I come up with ideas? And, and usually it's, for me, it starts as a problem that I observe. Uh, okay. And, you know, there's this adage, like you want to at least see that there's one person with this problem. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> it's a good start to make sure that somebody has the problem that you didn't just make yeah. it up out of whole cloth. Right. Exactly. So, uh, and then, and then look at the market dynamics, you know, um, I think it's some, somewhat counterintuitive, but are there, are there new entrants you know, it is, are, are there consumer trends, it, it, you know, that would favor the concept? Um, you know, how big is the market? How fast, fast is it growing? What's changing? Timing to me is the most important factor in the success of a startup. Oh, I've gotten the timing wrong. I started a social network out of Brown in 1994. <laughs> um, that's not called Facebook. It's um, not? Oh, okay. <laughs> 
I think we sold it for a million, a million dollars in Austin Power style. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but so, you know, you want to make sure that, 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 that you've got the timing right. And for us at Stash, there was, but dude, there you can't, I mean, you can't often control the timing. I mean, that's a, that's a very sort of external uh, phenomenon. I mean, but do you, do you find yourself with the idea and then assessing whether this is the right time based on your prior experience is like, you got to really, we have to pay attention to the timing. I've done it before where I didn't pay attention to the timing and it didn't, it didn't work out well. Yeah, that's exactly so, right. So that becomes part of the calculus in your evaluation of the concept. It sounds like. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's funny, you know, in, in the, in the Nelson center, we, and the students know this, there's a, there's this kind of the three the three steps of entrepreneurial process where it's sort of customer discovery and then it's a, a hypothesis around a, a solution slash value proposition and then there's making sure that the business is sustainable from an economics perspective but it, but you know you've brought up an interesting thing maybe there should be another step in there and uh, that's called make sure the timing's right to the extent you can is it that? So would you actually say, you know, I like those three, uh, but I'd get that timing in there? Yeah, I mean, I can give you three or four ventures I started with that are too early, you know, and there's nothing that you can do to fix that. You know, you can change your strategy, you can change your team, you can't change the timing. That's interesting. Um, so I do think it's really important. But, but I also, uh, I'm a big, big uh, customer discovery geek. Uh, yes. So oh, okay. So like the next step for me at, at, at Stash was stop thinking about the solution, focus on the problem and the customers, okay. hope you got the customers right, you know, and, and dig deep on interviews. So I'd interview, I think over the course of a couple of weeks, I interviewed a hundred people one-on-one -on -one for about okay. tw 20 minutes each. Mm -hmm. um, and always with someone there now, you can now on Zoom, you can record it, but to make sure that you're, if you're hearing what not what you want to hear but what you know what's really what they're really saying and Fair. and work just the problem angle and not touch the solution and just try to understand so talk to me about investing you'd say and we'd hear well you know you'd see the body language which is super important to me and any emotions is super important too but like uh, i know i should do it but i don't i'll do it later well okay so you know what's keeping you from doing it now well um I don't really know enough about investing. I'd have to, okay, you know, gotcha. I'll, I'll probably lose all my money and um, it's not really <laughs> relatable. It's not relatable to me. Like the terms, mm -hmm. the jargon, it's confusing. And no, no one, gotcha. no one on, I, does it that I know my parents lost their money in a way they don't do it. Um, and then. So you're, you're uh, collecting all of the reasons why. And then maybe as you start to, as you say, start to transition to imagining the solution, at least, you know, which things you're trying to fix in those, in those people's, uh, you know, reaction to investing in this. Yeah, case. exactly. And I also stack rank those problems to understand oh, you know, what are the biggest ones and, and try to come up with like three. So it's a, it's a manageable number and then flip it around and, and do solution interviews. We would say, well, what if, you know, you know, and one of the big challenges for people was I don't have enough money. So we'd say, well, what if you could start with five dollars? Wow. You know? Okay. Well, then it's not scary. Well, then I could do it. Then I probably start now. You know, what if we gave you a choice of thirty investments and they were relatable, like clean and green, or global citizen, or you know, gotcha. things that you could get your head around? Like, oh yeah, then I could make a choice, which is what they wanted. Um, I mean, and, you know, this is this is weirdly, uh, you know. Um, highly validating with uh, a lot of the stuff that we actually do in B-Lab. And I think there's a, just a really strong desire. It, de it depends on the student and the venture, but uh, many of them, they, they just want to get to that prototype, whether it's writing the software or, or building the gizmo or whatever it is, there's just, just really strong. The, everybody's talking about MVPs, minimally viable products. It's like, oh, I want to get my MVP out. But it sounds like your experience is like, hold on, hold, just hold your horses, you, you know, make sure you're building something that at least a couple of people really want. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think, I think there's, you know, there's even MVP MVPs, right? Like after this process, oh. which I think is super important. <laughs> you like a me. little M, a little MVP. And a, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think, you know, um, first of all, I think the customer of discovery to me is the foundation on which the rest of the build the business is built okay. and um 
it, you're, you're going to have doubts and dark days and be able to go back and say, I heard a hundred people say this to me, look me in the eye and say, this would be amazing. And I didn't even suggest it to them. They told me what their problem is. And they told me that that problem had a big impact on them. And it was important to gotcha. them. And, gotcha. um, it, you know, I think you come back to that and, and, you know, and then, but there's other things you can do in between that, right? Like, I mean, you can build a deck. That's, I, I did that a lot where I just build a oh, simple okay. deck and I'd mm -hmm. march into a VC and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And they'd shoot it down and I'd take out that slide and I put it in another slide and then go back okay. to another VC the next day. Sort and of like just, experimenting on investors. Yeah. 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 Or, you know, yeah. industry insiders, um, because it's just anything that you can do there that's super quick that you can get an interesting read and start the conversation. Because I think a lot of times you can't really see these opportunities totally from the outside. You kind of have to get in there and look around and you probably are not going to end up with your original idea, but some version sure. of it. Gotcha. No. Interesting. And then customer. Well, yeah. Then sorry. Go on. No, I was just going to I was just going to take you a slightly different place and because I, I really like hearing about the process. But I, I wanted to, to bring up something, and you and I, I got your approval to talk about this. You have an extraordinary thing, honestly, in your LinkedIn profile. And I'm just going to quote uh, from it because I think it's interesting. There's a six-year period in that profile that you group all under one thing, and not to get too LinkedIn about it, but you say the following thing, that in that six-year period, you experimented with a lot of ideas that didn't have outcomes worthy of headlines. And then you proceed <laughs> to actually name them by name, even though they're not worthy of headlines, and sort of detail kind of why they went sideways or why you dropped them. And I just, I felt like that was quite courageous. And I wanted to ask, why the heck did you do that? Why, <laughs> why would you, it's like kind of like airing the dirty laundry in a way. Why did you open yourself up to that kind of scrutiny, the scrutiny of your failures, so to speak. Well, I think one one reason, first of all, I'm impressed that you read it. And also, I, it, I'm also, I also cringed when you told me that you read it because I almost forgot that I put it in there. But, <laughs> okay. um, you know, I mean, I like to, I'd like to say, and I think it's important that part of this is failure. Like, you know, you're, you're unfortunately, yeah. it's just part of your success is failing your way. Okay. To success and it's just part of this process and it's a little different than than you you know experience at a job you know in corporate america mm -hmm. um uh, well because but, the venture is uh, very much about you isn't it and so it, it's it, it it feels like it's much more personalized the failure is kind of like on you it's very personal and you know the numbers are not in your favor 90 plus percent of new ventures right something right. like that fail and right. And you're doing something in, often that, I mean, you have to understand what kind of risk you're taking, but in many cases that hasn't been done before or done, done this way and it's just risky. But, but I think for me, a lot of the reason I put that out there was also uh, because I get questions like, what did you do from this time to this time? Because ah, let's say it's a the it's telltale gap in the timeline, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and I'd rather say, hey, I tried to build a social network than, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, at least to other entrepreneurs, we all go, yep, of course you failed a bunch of times. And oh, it's kind of interesting that you tried a music playlist before there was Spotify and you tried a social network before there was LinkedIn or Facebook. And at least you, you, you know, you, you've got some insights, obviously. Right, right. Well, I, you know, I, I do think it's courageous. And I think, you know, the, the narrative that's kind of in the popular press is often it's all about success, success. And it's like, oh, brilliant idea, billionaire. It's like, it's, it's, that's kind of the, the motif that sometimes the aura around entrepreneurship, but anybody who's in it knows that it's definitely not that way. But I think that's partly because people tend to, you know, hide the things that are painful to, 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 uh, to air. And so I think that's, that's really, that's a wonderful, I wouldn't, I mean, now that, now that I pointed it out, don't take it out. I'm going to ask you, don't take it out because I think it's actually heartening for people to see that real, that successful entrepreneurs sometimes kind of stumble along the way. I think it's terrific. So, you know, one, one other thing I wanted to, to touch on, and, and I, I'm going to apologize in advance, our time is really short. There's, there's a lot of uh, investors are always, you know, I've even heard real investors go, I invest in three things, team, team, team. And it's kind of like, okay, got it. But 
if you're if you're a, a a founder, especially if you're a solo founder, and we have lots of solo founder ventures in um, in B Lab this year, a disproportionately high number, I think, because of the pandemic, and it's just hard to to get people together. Um, what's this? Is there a secret sauce to getting other people interested to share your vision to get them cranked up enough that they'll quit their job and come and join this crazy new venture? Any any guidance? Any any brilliant thoughts about that? I guess it depends if you're talking about a co-founder or employee. For employees, I, have, I, I, I typically look for people who want either want to be an entrepreneur or have tried and failed to be an entrepreneur. Because ah. I usually think, like, let's say there's an engineer and they're a great engineer and they're working at Google. And like, what am I going to offer this person? Like, I can't offer them more money than they have now. Gotcha. They have to gotcha. really, the only thing I can offer that Google can is they're going to have a chance to build and they're going to have a chance to learn about starting something from scratch mm -hmm, or from mm -hmm. very early stage. And if, if they don't care about that, they're probably not going to want to come sat, you know, earn less and take a risk on mm -hmm. working with me. Um, so that's something that I look for in, in, in teams. Gotcha. But on the, to, also, to you know, you, go ahead. It, it's scary to have people who have never been in a startup to join you because that's a whole other risk for them. And that it could, it could not be a they could get freaked out by uh, by the uncertainty and uh you know the day-to-day -day threat of, of dissolution and and so forth so that's that's interesting um well sadly our our little fireside chat is sort of coming to a close but i i wanted to ask one final thing of you which is kind of a back to the future uh type of question uh so you're you're an experienced successful entrepreneur you you you, you allow us the opportunity to share in the learning of your failures and so forth. So I wonder if if you could, I don't know which direction is the past. I'm all turned around, but <laughs> if you could, if you could send put the little back to the future a message that you could send back to David Ronick. I don't know, pick a year, 1992, maybe not not like teenager, but after you're out of school, maybe even after your MBA. What what message would you send back? to David Roenick, 1990-something? I mean, there's so much. And I think the world's changed <laughs> so much, too. You know, Fair. back then, you had to build everything. Like in technology, like we had to have a room full of people build message boards because there were no message boards. You know, gotcha. there was no, you, there weren't things that you could plug in, um, which I think is part of timing. Is you know, comes back to the, the important of, like oh, to the things that I tend to build usually just because the way my brain works is it's not, okay, I'm going to imagine something like a flight to Mars, like Elon Musk, that it's the mind blowing, but it's more like building upon existing systems. Like, okay, um, Betterment worked with um, those guys for treat, you know, clearing and execution. And mm -hmm. I can do that too. And I can put this together with this together with this in a different way. And that's how I see a uh, path to something innovative. Um, I, I think okay, that's, that's more than that's more than two sentences. You don't. Okay. I mean, you don't. You don't get. You don't get a, a thesis <laughs> to send back to the young David Ronick. What's the what? What is it? What do? What are you going to send back to help him? I don't. I don't know. Is it to succeed or to fail? What are you going to tell him? Are you going to tell him look for ways to to leverage other people's work? Might be. I don't know. Maybe. I, I, I guess <laughs> I'm, also. I'm putting you on the spot terribly. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I think you know it, it. It's tricky to come up with one to to narrow it down is, to one thing. Is. I think I think part of it also is is the importance of taking this phased approach. You know, where you okay. don't go and build the whole thing and then see kind of like what you were saying about students, don't go gotcha. and build a Ferrari, go, you know, if you can have a picture of it or a bicycle that you can ride around the block, if that will do, start there. Um, okay. You know, don't skip steps. If you there skip it your is. customer discovery, yeah. There it is. There is the message to the don't skip steps. I love it. That's even just three words. You could almost put it in Morse code and send it back there and it would fit on a piece of paper. Well, David, thank you so, so much to uh, share this time with, this, with the students, obviously, but I, I hope the others in the audience uh, took away some nice grounding and messages about entrepreneurship and thinking about ways to make an impact in the world. So really, really appreciative of your time. Thanks so much to all of you. And thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. It was great fun. Thanks so much.
Well, everyone, uh, not that you didn't come to see David Roenick, uh, but I, I hope you really did also come to hear from the students. And that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, and just so you know what, what's going to happen, we have all 16 ventures teed up live. Uh, we're going to run through them one after the other in alphabetical order by venture. Uh, they're just getting about 90 seconds. And so just so you know, these, these aren't meant to be kind of like traditional investor elevator pitches where we're trying to spur people to invest. It's really about getting you interested uh, and identifying with the needs in the world that they've, that they've been working on and, and perhaps the, the ways that they see a, a future solution to those things. I want to encourage you to uh, applaud after them or what, whatever comes naturally here in Zoom. It would just be terrific. Uh, so fantastic. I think that's all I'm going to say. And I'm just going to check with staff. Are we ready to go? Thank you, Fabi. I appreciate that. And I'm going to fall silent. And I'm just going to sit back and watch the show myself. So take it away. Hello. My name is Sydney Schwartz, and I am a co-founder at Allo. Staff shortages, poor inventory management, and employee fraud are all contributing factors to the small margins that the restaurant industry faces today, and are all issues that our computer vision technology is able to solve. COVID hit the restaurant industry hard. In March of 2020, restaurants couldn't afford to shut down and wait for the pandemic to end. They had to evolve with the pandemic, shift towards outdoor dining, shift towards online delivery services, and even now, they are not the same as they were before. Restaurants are now absolutely dependent on technology and have become more willing to partner with softwares that boost their hospitality and increase their margins. In the kitchen, our cameras will be able to detect and prevent fraud, keep track of inventory, and prevent incorrectly bagged to-go orders. In the dining room, our cameras will keep track of and optimize wait times for customers, minimize waiter interruptions, standardize waiter service and gather information on customer satisfaction to maximize the hospitality of a given restaurant. My co-founder Olivia and I are both technical founders eager, eager to apply our expertise in computer vision to help restaurants stay afloat and thrive in a post COVID world. I invite anyone in the audience who may be able to connect us with restaurant managers or owners as we could continue to conduct our bottom up research or anyone who would like to chat, please join our breakout room. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Christine and my venture is Bamboo Chats. Asian Americans are the least rep likely race to make it to management level positions in America. Despite making up 12% of the American workforce, only 1.9% of all corporate officers are Asian American. In other words, Asians are severely underrepresented in executive level positions. And that's not to mention all the other discrimination we face in the workplace. This is what we call the bamboo ceiling the barriers that prevent Asian Americans from reaching executive level positions. Now, in addition, according to our research, almost 89% of all Asian American college students want to have career chats. However, up to 40% of college students have never had a single career chat. And this disparity is mainly due to three reasons. Who do you talk to? What do you even talk about? And how do you find someone to talk to? And that's where Bamboo Chats comes in. We are taking care of the who, what, and how by matching and scheduling students and professionals in the Asian American community for one-time, one-on-one career chats. We are creating a space where professionals can share their experience of being Asian in the workplace, as well as an opportunity for college students to meet Asian role models. By simplifying networking, we are bringing together the Asian American community to break the bamboo ceiling. We are currently looking for professionals and students in the Asian American community to either share your experience of career chats with us or participate in our ongoing matching cycles. If you are interested in supporting our mission to break the bamboo ceiling, I ask you to either check out our website, which will be sent in the chat or join our breakout rooms later. Thank you. Would you buy toothpaste from a gallery? Probably not. So why buy art from Amazon? Art is an innately human experience. It describes and captures the feelings, emotions, and ethereal nature of being a human. But unfortunately for us, buying art is a lot like buying toothpaste. We get soulless descriptions, we hear nothing from, our, from the artist, and we have just a few stills to, buy our, or to base our purchase off of. This is the problem my venture Bask is solving. We are creating a social media platform that revolves around the story of why artists create art connecting artists and patrons of the art. 
Serving as a two-sided marketplace, artists will be able to talk about the story of what inspires them, what art means to them. They'll be able to display their emotion and they will be able to do studio tours and live Q and A's with patrons. On the other side, patrons get the opportunity to do deep filtering based on artists' attributes that they may enjoy and specific pieces of art that they might want, as well as talk about a specific work from an artist that they've seen on the platform and how it has inspired them. Our team is led by me, Brantley Leapart, a recent graduate of Brown University who has been vetted, in this, vetted experience in the software engineering industry, as well as a background in storytelling. If you are ready to stop looking at art and ready to bask in art, we invite you to our, our breakout room after to talk about next steps and future growth. Thank you so much. The number one concern of every mobile device user is to make absolutely sure that they never run out of power. Yet over 1 billion people find themselves in situations where this happens. These are people who experience temporary powder outages due to natural disaster, outdoor travelers such as backpackers and beachgoers, soldiers on multi-day missions, and people who live in underserved areas. However, there are no energy generators on the market that meet these people's need for portable and reliable power. Portable power banks require access to the electric grid in the first place. Standalone power systems are immobile, such as diesel generators and wind turbines. Human power generators, such as pedal generators and hand crank generators, are heavy and have a low power output. Portable solar panels are not reliable on cloudy days and at night. Our solution, the buzz button, combines the unusually high speed of the classic button spinner toy with an induction, genera induction generator to blow past every existing energy generator's power to weight ratio, making for a portable, powerful, and easy to operate solution. Physical experiments with our patent pending device and our underlying theoretical physics model show that our device can generate up to 20 watts of power while weighing less than one and a half pounds, enough power to fully charge the latest iPhone batteries in under 25 minutes. If you would like to learn more about the buzz button, please join us in our breakout room or contact us via email, which I've included in the chat. Thank you. Raise your hand if you like trying new food. The New York Post says that 84% of us are willing to wait an hour and a half in line to try a new trendy restaurant dish. But turns out that over half the people in the line end up not liking the dish because it wasn't suited for their taste. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm willing to bet that one of the main reasons is that you don't want to risk trying something that you don't like. Introducing Dangy. Dangy is a mobile app that uses artificial intelligence or AI to recommend restaurant dishes tailored to your tastes. Dangy finds users with similar tastes as you and analyzes ingredients in various dishes to recommend the best ones for you. Ever been to a restaurant and not know what to order? Dangy helps you decide what to eat by analyzing the menu and recommending the dishes you'll love most. Now, after finding your new favorite dish, dang it, share and rate dishes based on taste, spiciness, and value. You can also grow your foodie following by making fun TikTok-like videos of your reactions. My name is Jason Wang. This is Elijah, and we're the founders of Dangy. We're AI researchers who've presented at AI symposiums and international competitions. We've also built a mobile app featured in nine news outlets, including the Boston Globe. We want to invite you to join our early access list. Everyone, please take a moment right now. Click on our website linked in the chat and sign up to be the first to discover restaurant dishes you'll love. Hi everyone, my name is Luna Ito Fisher and I'm a co-founder of Decrypted by Us. So computer science classes teach theory and concepts, but to learn practical skills and succeed in industry, students have to turn to online resources like YouTube and just Googling the problems they have. However, online computer science spaces lack diversity. If you go to YouTube right now and search up a technical topic, you'll see the majority of creators are white and male but this doesn't represent the diverse range of people that can go into the tech field. It's intimidating and discouraging for minority students to have to be turning to these platforms day after day where they don't relate to the creators they're learning from and they don't see themselves represented. I talked to a student recently who told me that she completely avoids YouTube tutorials because it's all the typical computer science guy and she can't relate to any of them. 
And that's why our venture, Decrypted by Us, is an organization focused on building an online technical learning community made by and created for underrepresented, underrepresented people in computer science. We are directly improving the representation in these online resources so all students see themselves reflected in this space and see that anyone can pursue a career in tech. We're currently looking for connections to technical content creators as well as organizations that may be interested in partnering. We'd lo love to talk more with anyone in our breakout room after this. Hi. What if I told you all that social media actually encourages us to be antisocial? We're in an age where we feel more connected than ever, but it's also an age where things can, social media can feel just even more as isolated, like very isolating. And it's because social media gives the illusion of social interaction, but, but it takes away the chance for us to get to know the people around us better or meet new people. And because there's nothing actually out there really for getting people together in the real world. Like, for example, let's say you're new to a place, maybe you're an incoming student or you know, you're new to a job. There, there's almost this implicit sort of friend window where you form social groups and it can feel devastating when you feel like you've missed it. And so Emit, um, an app that I'm working with two co-founders is an app to arrange spontaneous hangouts among friends and people with shared interests to help reduce the friction of organizing group activities by making it very low pressure and as simple and quick as possible. Our vision for Emit is a, just a way for users to just be able to see who around them is available at any given moment. And we're actively working to improve. So please take, it, take some time to take a look at the app, uh, download it. My co-founder, Nate, will be posting the link to download it in the chat. And please join our breakout room if you want to learn more. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Martin, and I'm the founder of Enroot Agricultural Management in Atlanta, Georgia. Enroot is a real estate development and technology company embedding vertical farming equipment and food growth capacity within commercial real estate in and around cities across the United States. Lease owners need revenue on their vacant unused properties. Pressured farmers need space to scale their farming operations despite the rising costs in real estate. When I say farmer, I'm not just talking about those in the countryside with acres of land working on tractors. Farmers in more populated areas have to grow on any land they could find to be able to support their business operations with 15% of our food supply and farmers coming from cities globally. Enroot lends vertical farming capacity and the services of a 500 foot square foot space fitted with ready to grow equipment to farmers constrained in advancing their farming enterprises. We produce revenue on idle commercial leases with short term tenants at low to no renovation costs to the lease owners and to get the constricted farmer, we dispense vertical farming space and also equipment at low overhead, increasing their usage of efficient farming and environmental practices, catalyzing crop growth, and ultimately their sales capacity four to six times on average, being able to farm year round in our hydroponic grow areas. If you would like to know more about Enroot, come to our breakout session in the next session and also fill out our wait list uh, link coming up in the Zoom chat now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leslie Ponce Diaz and my venture is First Gen Chisme. Every time I come back home from college, I talk with my friend about our experiences and difficulties in being the first in our family to attend college. We share conversations where we often feel lost, pressured, and always feeling behind our other peers whose family did attend college. I realized that we were sharing our own First Gen Chisme, which translates to First Gen Gossip. The ability to uh, find and build a first gen community that can help support incoming students inspired the nonprofit First Gen Chisme. First Gen Chisme is a nonprofit tech app that focuses on providing first generation, low income, and BIPOC students with the needed academic and financial resources throughout their post secondary education. We provide school year long content and mentorship on academics, scholarships, FAFSA, mental health, and more. 
first-gen students need 24-7 support to successfully guide them through their education. Based on our bottom-up research, many first-gen students did not know or do not know where to start for asking for help. They need accessible resources that help them feel supported within their institutions. Nationally, 89% of low-income first-gen students leave college within six years without a degree. As a first-gen student myself, I speak from personal experience on the struggles that we face coming from under-resourced communities. First-gen Chisme believes that with access to direct resources, students would feel more supported and graduate their institutions with great success. If you're interested in learning more, please visit our resource website for more updates on our tech app and content. And let's continue to make education accessible to all students with First Gen Chisme. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yentin, and I'm the co-founder of Flowbits. So today's organizational tools simply cannot keep track and keep up with our complex and interconnected lives. We still spend too much time and energy tracking and coordinating our responsibilities instead of better using that time doing things we actually care about and finding new things to do that enrich our lives. At the same time though, organizations and small businesses that we love and that provide incredible value still struggle to distribute their events and their updates. Maintaining websites and sending bombardments of emails and newsletters is not only tedious for them, but also for the community that they try to keep up with. Flowbits, we at Flowbits, we reinvent the way that we organize and share this information. We replace dozens of steps and dropped balls with a single click. For you as a user, you will always know what, where, when, and with whom as you progress and move through your day. And with that time that our automation can provide, you can then use our platform to discover and nurture these interests that will directly integrate into your life with a single button click. Whether it be discovering a new workout routine, a new travel itinerary to that place you wanted to go, or new events by organizations that you care about like the Nelson Center here. And going back to these organizations and small businesses, these are the same ones that still struggle with the publicization and the ease of communication. But now with Flowbits also will have an unprecedented way to connect with and engage with their community. So with Flowbits, we can finally plan less and do more of what we love. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Saron, and I'm here to tell you a story, a story of a small business owner in West Africa, particularly in the Gambia. Her name is Fatu, and she's an entrepreneur selling clothing and personal care items as a living. She advertises her products on WhatsApp and Facebook to her limited group of family and friends. If she receives an order, she goes out into the busy streets of Banjul and delivers the product to her customers all by herself. And this is just not Fatu. About 60% of the labor force in the Gambia are employed in small enterprises as their main source of household income. On the flip side, the, the everyday Gambians depend on these sellers in order to get their essential items. These sellers are a critical part of the economy, yet they do not have a reliable means of securing customers and scaling up their business easily. In this marketplace, there is no Amazon, there is no Etsy, but there will be Joola, our venture. We empower small businesses in the Gambia with a digital marketplace, enabling people like Fatu secure a wide variety of customers, offer fast delivery, and accept payments seamlessly. In short, Joola saves the sellers and buyers time, energy, and money, allowing them to focus on the um, bigger and better things in life. Join us in our Zoom session to learn more about our venture. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ryan Burnett from Keyboard, currently working on igniting the mechanical keyboard marketplace. Real quick, if you don't know what a mechanical keyboard is, it's like a normal computer keyboard, except that each key is its own little mechanical switch. It sounds like a niche topic, you've probably never heard of it, but it's really and truly a booming industry to be valued at uh, $1.7 billion by next year. Uh, they're really fun to type on, great to use, but if you wanna go about building one, the process of uh, one, educating yourself, and two, finding all the parts can be extremely frustrating. Uh, it's hard to know what uh, plates and cases are compatible, especially when uh, the parts themselves can be kind of expensive and then shipping times long. 
And um, if you want to find the best parts, they're spread across, you know, a variety of different websites that are hard to find. Uh, you're not going to find the best things on like Amazon or Best Buy. You're going to find them on Novel Keys and the Key.com company. And I'll put $10 now. I'll put $10 down that none of you know what those websites are. But it's my goal at Key World to create an online tool where users can go and search and filter among a thousand keyboards and parts for the uh, best options that they're looking for from the vendors that currently exist in the marketplace. And so uh, I'm not selling keyboards, but uh, rather I'm passionate about acting as a middleman between end users and vendors so that uh, end users can have the confidence and security that they're buying the best parts from the best places. Uh, I'm going to link the website in the chat below. And if you're interested at all in mechanical keyboards, whether that's building one or helping me build out this venture, let me know. Reach out. And thank you. Good evening. We are Ladder Inc., a diversity-focused professional network and recruiting pipeline that serves both students of color and corporate recruiters. People of color are underrepresented and have been for several generations. As a result, many diverse students lack the social capital, the networks, and the experience to steer through the modern recruiting process. At the same time, companies are still failing to meet their diversity and inclusion goals, and their costly and inefficient recruiting systems aren't helping at all. This is where Ladder Inc. comes in. We offer a one-stop solution to the systemic disadvantages faced by students of color, and we provide recruiters with an innovative approach to acquiring and retaining diverse talent. Ultimately, we uplift POC communities through leveraging their respective strengths and experiences. And that means making career building resources and support accessible to everyone. With our tools, students can overcome knowledge barriers and form strong relationships across communities. On the other side, recruiters are guaranteed direct access to a diverse pool of students. Recruiters now have a way to effectively meet their recruiting targets and form meaningful connections with prospective candidates. With Ladder Inc., our users feel empowered in their career path and can successfully achieve their goals. My name is Sterling Steiger, and as co-founder of Ladder Inc., I can tell you firsthand that our team knows the frustration of feeling misunderstood all too well. We are the students that we service, and we are passionate about using what we've learned to transform the diversity of recruitment within corporations. If you're a professional or student interested in joining our platform's waitlist, please feel free to send an email to the address located in the chat and join us in our breakout room. Thank you for your time. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina Sandoval, and I'm the co-founder of Revive. Social good organizations of all types and sizes, from big nonprofits like the ACLU to really tiny social impact ventures, tend to share one thing in common, a desire to engage with an energized youth core. But from recruitment to retention, these organizations are really struggling to tap into that reservoir of youth passion. Many are unappealing and unknown to young people, like places that work with the elderly, medical care, and disability justice. Even those that do manage to appeal to youth often lack the capacity needed to train them properly, develop them into productive members, and sustain their involvement. There's a disconnect, and youth engagement is just out of reach. Youth, on the other hand, are always looking for ways to get involved. From our bottom-up research, we know that youth are constantly looking for ways to combat the injustices within their own communities. Yet, at the same time, they just don't know where to go and where to start, or even which organizations align with their academic and social interests. They feel hopeless, powerless, and even paralyzed. At Revive, we identify those youth, train them to be effective change makers, and pair them with relevant organizations. And by doing so, we simultaneously ensure that our organizational partners have trained, consistent teams of youth leaders. Organizations become not only more appealing to youth, but are guaranteed a really strong, consistent core of youth volunteers, interns, and general members. This disconnect is now repaired, leading to sustainable and efficient campaigns for social good. If you'd like to find out more, please join our breakout room for in the next session or contact us at the email addresses left in the chat. And together, let's revolutionize the way youth make change. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Terrell, and I'm the founder of The Ream Company. I, the Ream Company aims to offer US consumers a careful based product, um, a Sharia compliant insurance based on cooperation and mutuality. My faith calls for a different type of insurance called, called Zekefel. After navigating an ethical dilemma, my venture is based on my own experience of buying insurance products and feeling the disconnect between my faith and the requirements for insurance. The benefits of Zekefel inspired me to apply my values and relieve my guilty conscience. Better still, my expectation is that the Muslim community totaling about 4 million people may be early adopters, but not the only people who could benefit from Zekefel. 
So have you ever wished that you could get more buy-in and benefit from your, ins your lifetime of payments and of insurance premiums? Maybe moving away from a conventional carrier might be your answer, answer and moving towards Decathlon. Reem Company aims to be the first and most uh, aims to be the most trusted, excuse me, trusted Sharia compliant insurance brokerage in the United States. Join me in the breakout room to learn more about the difference between Decathlon and conventional insurance and also to learn more about the journey of the Reem Company. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Andrew Kim, and I'm a founder of Workista, which is an online market freelance marketplace for data scientists. In today's digital world, data is everywhere, and it powers everything we do. And for businesses, data is even more important for managing tasks like day-to-day -day operations and analyzing customer feedbacks. Due to an enormous increase in data consumption over the last few years, businesses are continuously looking to hire and outsource data scientists to better manage their data. But there's a problem. Finding the right data scientist is an excruciating process. Currently, the only option is to endlessly search for potential candidates through LinkedIn or use dev shops and agencies that take hefty commission fees anywhere from 20% to up to 50%. So Workista solves this problem. Workista is the only marketplace that specializes exclusively on hiring freelance data scientists. For quality control, we rigorously pre-screen our freelancers through rounds of interviews to form a network of expert data scientists. On top of that, we use state-of-the-art AI matchmaking algorithms to find data scientists that are best suited for your project. And best of all, we offer all of this commission-free and you can post a job for only $20 per project. So if you're a business owner or a recruiter looking for uh, to hire expert data scientists, join us at uh, waitlist at workista.com. Thank you so much. Oh my God, you guys were just terrific. Thank you for, they've really, really worked hard the last uh, few days to hone their message. And I just wanna congratulate each and every one of you. I hope everyone shares my enthusiasm for what you heard. Give them some emoji love, everyone. That would just, I'm sure they would love to see a standing ovation <laughs> with some emoji love. Anyway, really great job. Well, again, I want to thank our superstar guest, David Ronick, for joining us. Thank you again, David. That was a lot of fun. And, and uh, sorry it was such a short time. I still had another half an hour of questions for you, but we just, we just couldn't fit everything in. Really inspiring commentary about some of your uh, adventures as a, and misadventures as an entrepreneur. And again, thank you to everyone in the audience for coming and sharing your energy with the students, just having everyone here, including, I have to say, the Dean of the College of Brown University, Rashid Zia. Hello, Professor and Dean Zia. Uh, just to have the Dean here of the entire college really shows the profile of entrepreneurship here at Brown. So, all right. So, Thank you again, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, and I hope you'll stick around and, and jump in and talk to some of the ventures. All right. See everyone.